Hello and most welcome to 1843 of the Heidegger series. Could almost call it the Wittgenstein series. We will today continue with Warren Goldfarb, Farb's rule following revisited. And last time we looked at Dummett and Kripke's conception of rule following and how that led to a sort of anti-realism. Wittgenstein, however, goes one step further. He is not solely, so to speak, claiming that it's not grounded. He is also claiming that there is no groundlessness. And Kripke nor Dummett go so far. And that is especially clear in the example of the wayward child or the pupil, where we see that at any time in the continuation of the algorithm, any rule potentially can apply at every instance. So we cannot know the rule as a rule a priori. But at that very instance, it is possible because action is the foundation, not a rule that lies beyond our realm of doings. Here we have from paragraph 186, it would almost be more correct to say, not that an intuition was needed at every point, but that a new decision was needed at every point. That is very close to Dummett's anti-realism, as long as one ignores the almost, because we cannot claim anti-realism or radical conventionalism either. We can only have further in, in indication is that we can only have particular explanations, not general ones. No matter how much we would like that, the explanations will be particular, instantaneous, circumstantial, I think it's a good word. So we go to page 77 and correctness. Now we'll con uh, continue my read. Now we are into second paragraph, eight lines down, beginning with Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein wants to suggest how we too quickly take characterizations of ordinary cases to provide general support for a philosophical notion of correctness.
I can, after all, describe myself as knowing what the correct continuation is after any particular number. I intend the rule add two in a particular way. And then it's correct to say that I know what the correct continuation is. It can even be unobjectionable to describe myself in the following way. When I said add two, I meant that after a thousand, you should write one thousand and two, two. That can seem correct and commonplace. Wittgenstein is asking why we think that that gives any general answer to the notion of how correctness is constituted. The accuracy of the description, I meant that you should write 1002 after 1000. Depends on my knowing what the rule is. It does not give any independent support, as he suggests in 187. We can describe ourselves as knowing what the correct continuation was. And it is consequent that we would describe ourselves as meaning that one thousand and two was to be written after a thousand, but it gives us nothing more.
and Wittgenstein may be trying to point this out by reminding us that there's no particular fact to me that amounts to my knowing that a thousand and two was to be written after a thousand. But it gives us nothing more. And Wittgenstein may be trying to point this out by reminding us that there's no particular fact to me that amounts to my knowing that a thousand and two is to be written after a thousand. If there were, then presumably there would need to be another fact that amounted to my knowing that a thousand and four is the correct continuation of a thousand and two, and so on. And that is clearly not the case, or at least there's no reason to think it is. It is not any look locatable fact that gives us the sense what it is to know all of this. In the interlocutors talking generally about how one means the formula as determining how to go on. In the tone of voice that appears in paragraph one hundred and eighty six. It seems that the interlocutor is trying to get at some sense of meaning that gets behind any extra explanations one would give or any extra expressions that one would actually write down. Something that underlies any possible explanation.
it is that which the interlocutor thinks would really determine how to go on. In the philosophical tone of voice, how you mean the sign is meant to be beyond anything that could be captured by a mere expression. The interlocutor is not interested in just getting one more expression how you meant something. For after all, that will not get you any further in the quest for what really determines how you go on. What the interlocutor wants is something beyond the ordinary use of meaning the formula. That is what paragraphs 188 and 197 are meant to point out. Wittgenstein uses metaphorical remarks to try to capture this, as in paragraph one, hundred and eighty eight here I'd like to say first of all your idea was that this meaning the order had in its own way, already taken all those steps. That in meaning it, your mind as it were, flew ahead. and took all the steps before you physically arrived at this or that one.
inspections 189 and 190. Focus on the relation of determination between how the rule is meant and the way of going on. And explicitly contrast good and bad ways of taking that notion These sections are meant to point up that the interlocutor is placing a metaphysical demand on the grounding for a self sufficient item that does all the work in determining the continuation. This is the essential background to the paradox of paragraphs 198 and 201. But how can a rude teach me what I have to do at this point. After all, whatever I can do on some interpretation be made compatible with the rule. Wittgenstein responds, no, that is not what one should say. The rather this, rather this, every interpretation hangs in the air together with what it interprets and cannot give it any support. The response seems to make the matters worse. But note that it pointedly lacks the notion of accord with the rule.
the interlocutor thinks we can have different interpretations of the rule that determine different continuations. Wittgenstein is saying that that is mistaken. Every interpretation still hangs in the air. The interlocutor is using the idea of interpretation to make any one continuation look groundless. But Wittgenstein is saying that what makes it look groundless is already incorporated into the idea that we have multiple determinations It is the idea of determination that is incoherent. The interlocutor has already brought too much into the picture. It is as though we had an idea of the unconditioned determination of the correct continuation. You want the rule to do that. You see that the rule does not do that. So you conclude that the rule plus interpretation must do that. But then you have different interpretations. And so you get the conclusion that the continuation is groundless.
That is what the interlocutor is doing. And Wittgenstein's retort is an expression of the point that there is an illicit notion of determination that is presupposed in the interlocutor's reaction to the parable. Now, the interlocutor is confused by this, unsurprisingly. He asks, So is whatever I do compatible with a rule? Wittgenstein turns that question aside for the moment in a somewhat maddening way. Instead, he gives a counter story, so to speak. that there are connections between the expression of the rule and the ways that we actually go on with the rule. So he suggests, suggests, when we talk about following a rule, we are making essential reference to our practices. We could not call anything acting on a rule without these ins institutions and practices. Indeed, the possibility of different interpretations rests on this. It does all hang in the air without the background of acting on rules. Without the actual actions of people engaging in what we call acting on a rule, there will be nothing 
about a rule that would give us anything. in paragraph 201. Wittgenstein returns to the question he had turned aside in paragraph 198. He says, This was our paradox. No course of action could be determined by a rule. Because every course of action can be brought into a court with the room. The answer was if every course of action can be brought into accord with the room, then it can also be brought into conflict with it. So there would be neither accord nor conflict here. That's an answer to the paradox. It seems to be an even more drastic restatement of the paradox. Indeed. There is a flat way of taking the paradox. Namely, that it does show that there really is no accord and no conflict. One way of summarizing Kripke and Dummit is that they do precisely that. But to take Wittgenstein's response in that way is to mistake the play within the play for the main drama. As David Pierce wrote,
the paradox arises given an agenda. What Wittgenstein wants to do is to unravel that agenda. Not to conclude that one actually obtains a paradox. That is indicated by the oddity in the way that the answer is framed. One might say that formulating the paradox requires use of the notion of accord or correctness. The paradox pretends to show that the notion is not good enough or not what we want, but the answer suggests that the notion employed is puffed up at the start. The paradox can be formulated as anything can be correct. So it is stated as Though we already have the notion of correctness and we see that it is defective because it is not determinative, Wittgenstein's answer is that there is no notion of correctness of the sort the interlocutor intense what is to obey a rule is not something that come from within from some idea of content rather it comes from what we call following a rule, from our practices, but it is not grounded in anything. And grounded is a determinant word in the least. This reading, so I'd say that's a pretty good ways to put a pause.
grounded in anything is the last two words or three words. Page seventy nine, indeed. Let's look into some quotes. Dense piece of text, I admit. And uh, we read merely two pages. Not even that. Well, it's about three pages here. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Go to page 77. Um, how can we find our way here? Second paragraph, eight line. And now it's the second line from the bottom where it starts. So the bottom you have that, that would be correct to stop. After a thousand hours start. But it gives us nothing more. And listen now. And Wittgenstein may be trying to point out this by reminding us that there is no particular back to me that amounts to my knowing that 1002 is to be written after a thousand. That is a pretty massive, well-packed message. And he brings out a paradox in the next sentence. If there were, then presumably there would need to be another fact <laughs> that amounted to my knowing that 1004 is the correct continuation after 1002. And so on. Ad infinitum. There's creation of a million rules. Doesn't make sense. If we continue, go to the next paragraph. In the philosophical tone, and I think you know by now what the philosophical tone is. In the philosophical tone of voice, how you mean the sign is meant to be beyond anything that could be captured by the mere expression. There are according to the philosophical tone or the interlocutor, 
something more. Something inner or something outer, but there is something more. Sort of beyondness somewhere. If we go to the next page, 78, and uh, it would be difficult since you have an other edition here. Uh, if you go up a little bit, not too much, a bit. A very good sentence here. It went up a bit too much. They are perfect. No, you're correct now. There you are. And that would be the six line or seven line from the bottom of that. Paragraph, paragraph. Just after paragraph or as in paragraph 188. Here I'd like to say first of all, your idea was that this meaning the order had its on its own way, already taken all those steps that in meaning it, your mind, as it were, flew ahead and took all the steps before you physically arrived at this or that one. I think that sort of captured it in a neat way what transcendentalism or a priori is. Another way of explaining it, that your mind sort of, in this imaginary situation, flew beyond the continuation of the wayward child or pupil or yourself and found at the end of the number series the complete continuation. This Impossible, of course. And at the end of this paragraph, we have some more helps here. It's very helpful, the text. Lean is pedagogical. These sections are meant to point up that the interlocutor is placing a metaphysical demand on the grounding for a self-sufficient item that does all the work, go for, sorry, does all the work in determining the continuation. So that the metaphysical demand is lying, as we said previously, ahead yourself, physically leaving your body and everything, and be ahead of yourself, is a very nice new explanation by Goldfarb. Sorry, I got your name wrong here in my emotional state. And what does that mean to help you understand even more? Well, it means also another thing that I add here, we can become completely passive. The rule does the work for us. So we don't have to use thinking or adding, correcting. 
You do not have to engage in the world. We're looking at the world from above or inside ourselves because the world has rules and they take care of everything. Does it ring a bell? Well, let's see about that. Let's go to the paragraph that begins with now. It's the next one. Yeah, that's the one. But down even a bit, up a bit more, up a bit more. Or are we confusing up and down here? I should be more consistent. If you go up with the text towards the top of the screen, but not too much. A bit more, if you please. Up, up with the text. Uh, down then, let's say down, if that helps more. I want to go further in the text. A bit further. Sorry to confuse you. Here we are. And if we go to the fourth line here, so he suggests when we talk about following a rule, we are making essential reference to our practices. Which we would not call anything acting on a rule without these institutions and practices. Indeed, the possibility of different interpretation, interpretations rests on this. It does all hang in the air without the background of acting on rules. And listen now, it's very well put by Goldfarb, without the actual actions of people engaging in what we call acting on a rule, there would be nothing about a rule that would give us anything. So here, Wittgenstein Goldfarb goes so far to say that if we bring the idea of the interlocutor, Frege and others, to its reductio ad absurdum, we wouldn't be doing anything. Because these made up ideas are metaphysical going ahead. Simply, are simply not there. And I think this is an extraordinary good comment against the Tegmarkian Hugh Everestian view or the Platonic cave understanding. Let's see. We go further in the text. So we go to the next page, 79. And we go to the second paragraph on page 79. The paradox can be formulated as anything could be correct. So it is stated as though we already have the notion of correctness 
and we see that it is defective because it is not determinative. And of course, Wittgenstein's answer that there is no notion of correctness of the sort, the interlocutor intense. What is to obey a rule is not something that comes from within, from some idea of content. Rather, it comes from what we call following a rule from our practices. And you hear that it is not something that comes from within. It's the private language argument, PLA, turns up here. That there is a content inside of us somewhere that corresponds. No, it is not grounded in anything, nor is it not grounded. It's our practices to decide. And without practices, even the idea of these metaphysical rules would cease to have any sense whatsoever. They need the force of practices. They need that we do something with them. A lot of comments from my part, sorry about that, but the text is pretty condensed. Carla, please come in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so let's meet, let me take up uh, this phrase, hangs. Uh, so Wittgenstein writes, No, that's not what one should say, rather this, every interpretation hangs in the air together with what it interprets, and I cannot give it any support. And here we could compare with quantum physics about um, Superposition. Oh yeah. Superposition. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, superposition about uh, something is hanging in the air, so to say. Uh, say uh, before you open the box, the cat can be in three possible uh, uh, states, as we know. So the cat is, so to say, hanging in the air. Yeah. In different states. This is. Um, uh, Wittgenstein is here at least uh, is in uh, um, in line with quantum physics. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, he is most definitely in line with quantum physics. And another word uh, that I would like to the gap. Okay, it was in the last paragraph that we went. Um, oh, you could oh, uh, take even. Uh, any uh, paragraph, we could take the rule. Rule is a complicated word in a, in a way. Um, I would compare it to ease up understanding um, with ruler, like a ruler uh, you have in physics. And we think that the ruler is easy to uh, understand rule, a, ru a ruler like something scientific. It's scientific, of course. But it's, it doesn't say it's, uh, that things are objective. A ruler is not in objective per se, as no, 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 classical no. physics would say. Um, the lady, the remarks Stalov, has pointed out that uh, we are, the observer is interwoven um, with the thing that uh, she rules or measures. So, uh, because the ruler, or so to say, the, ins uh, the device, the inst um, instrument, the device with, which acts as a measuring device, 
is interwoven with the observer. Oh yeah, very well. Yes, it's even more than measuring. It's the creator. The ruler is the creator of either particle or wave. Very good, yeah. Mm. So therefore, as a rule, is so abstract word really. It's, uh, it's easy to think that there is an objective rule out there somewhere. But it's, as uh, Wittgenstein and Goldfarb points out, point out, that it's, it depends on uh, practices, human practices, actions. And like I say, uh, the key word here would be um, actual. Let's see, it's not this, uh, the second one. Um, uh, let's see. See that we have that. Um, um, now here, here. So it's uh, actual access of people. So that's uh, that's uh, what rules are. The rules are what actual people do. Yeah. Yes. And not anything else. So there is no. Even in the universe, we don't have any rules hanging in there, so to say. But they, they depend on. The observer on observers. Well, it's it's a bit like uh, if I say some sort of game, I can watch it and I can take notes of it and I can construct my rules of the mm. football game, for instance. Mm. But I'm not participating, and my rules will not be the actual rules. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, and. Uh... To go back um, to my uh, previous uh, um, uh, phrase about hanging there, and I, I, I would, it would be fun in some time in the future to do a Wittgensteinian interpretation of the of Schrodinger's cat, and uh, have this oh, yeah, funny picture definitely. in my head of a cat, literally, mm. so to say, or metaphorically, hanging there uh, in different states. I think the picture is fits with the um, with Wittgenstein's interpretation and with quantum physics. Uh, it's really nowhere the cat. Yes. Well, when we get problem with uh, uh, quantum physics is when we are bringing these imaginary to imaginary metaphysical rules uh, into quantum physics, but in practice. As we all know, there's no problem whatsoever with quantum mechanics. Mm. It works perfectly. Much better than classical physics. Mm, absolutely. So I'm happy that Wittgenstein and quantum physics go hand in hand. Uh, I said by now, I would say by now, I'm, I'm deeply convinced by that. There's mm. no question at all. Let me only mention one last thing, uh, this. About, uh, I think one keyword is self-sufficient self item. Um, so it's, we can think about a computer, modern computer, or yeah. even yeah. AI, 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 artificial intelligence. <clears throat> um, we think that uh, I, I <laughs> artificial intelligence can do thinking. Uh, artificial intelligence would follow a rule. Um, some kind of rule, objective rule, but uh, it cannot really think because it's it doesn't have any practice. No. Except perhaps in, in um, uh, what was the name of the Swiss professor now again? Um, Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer, thank you. <laughs> Who uh, did construct such robots, um, I, uh, artificial intelligence robots, uh, and um, Memories. Oh based, yeah, the memory is based on action. That is yes. Uh, very good, very good. A computer doesn't move about. It doesn't participate. It doesn't have a Geschichte. There is no background to a computer, so it's lacking a gazillion things, gazillion actions. I'm asking myself if uh, this is the way um, for uh, perhaps the future is in um, these kind of robots that 
wife has constructed. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't think that these computers would be able to. Uh, they could, uh, in five five cases, they can actually think out uh, a right to one thousand, and then they would probably continue with one thousand two, one thousand four. But I wonder if any com uh, computer would be able to jump to 1004, uh, so to say, break the habit. Uh, I don't know. But no, neither do I. But what I heard rumor-wise, and this is of course nothing you can find on the net, mm. is that in Japan their artificial intelligence is much closer to the Pfeiffer one. Mm. But they have a better understanding of the connection of rules and action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think it's a nice to... place as ever to end, don't you think, Kalle? Yes, let's end here. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for participating, Kalle Lundahl. Thank you everyone for listening in. Have a very nice morning, day, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Uh, 